Um, hi, everybody. I'm Marissa. Uh, uh, my advisor, just off of that, is Ron. So uh, all my work uh, couldn't have been done without him and then all the other graduate students who partaked in this. So um, uh, well, I got my bachelor's in astronomy, and then I was really interested in just teaching high school level students. And so I got my earth science teaching license, which is only valid in Massachusetts. But then I decided to come out here for grad school, get my master's. And I just tagged along with some students, got involved with pile tube ballooning. And then a year later, I said, oh, I'll get my ham radio license and really get involved. So then I uh, went with some of our local launches, which is out in Kempton, about 20 minutes away. Uh, Ron introduced me to HASP, NASA's high Food student platform. I was involved with that for two years. Uh, we collaborate, collaborated with the University of North Florida as well. And then I was a coordinator of the Near Space Balloon Competition, which is targeted towards 6th through 12th grade students all across the state of North Dakota. And that was a lot of fun and was the inspiration for my thesis work, work which I did last year, finished uh, in March of this year. So that's just the evolution of how I got here, which I'm going to present my thesis work um, and some uh, examples of the NSBC, which is the competition. So I asked around. I contacted the education, uh, you know, Dr. Ingleson, an education professor here at UND. And she put me in touch with an eighth grade uh, earth science teacher, Mr. Brent Newman. He gave me about 130 of his students, and we were able to integrate our own grade-wide uh, balloon launch. And I integrated that into his, right after his astronomy unit, he was moving into meteorology, and they uh, were currently working on remote sensing, which uh, was perfect timing for an interdisciplinary balloon launch. So I contacted uh, Dr. Ingleson, and we worked out how to submit the students and give them a pre and post test. I did a lot of review in the literature of how do you go around evaluating a balloon launch. And so I used a lot of STEM examples. Uh, so there's a lot of just rocketry examples. And then I also looked at such as Taylor University. They work with middle school kids. And so I, I created this template for my thesis. And so NSBC is from uh, it lets students from all across the state apply and then we launch which we we're supposed to launch today but it was raining uh, but those are typically students that volunteer themselves they're already interested in stem whether it's an after-school program of you know say students from rocketry hear about this and then they they voluntarily come so I wanted to target everybody of you know all the females all the males who may or may not have voluntarily done this. So I was able to use all our facilities here at UND, all our expertise on ballooning. We use KMOP balloons. Uh, for my launch, we used two 1,500 gram balloons. We complied with everyone, the FAA, FCC, uh, and especially the FSO here at UND. Uh, and the last point on here, uh, the international airport here at Grand Forks is actually the 17th busiest airport in the country. And it's mostly in part to the aviation school here. There are always planes up in the air, and they're always practicing. So it was very important. And Paramount, because the Valley Middle School, the school that I used, is right in Grand Forks. And it's really hard to transport 130 students, all the staff and faculty. So it was critical that we stayed nearby. So I thought that you know, if I do imply this ballooning mission, they're going to have a, a greater appreciation for STEM. They're going to want to pursue this uh, in high school, and then perhaps they get really interested and they come here to UND. So, like I said, 124 participants, and this was quite daunting. 54% uh, were female, 46 male, which is uh, very encouraging to me. There's, I'm focusing on you know encourage the females as well, which is equally important. Uh, so I gave them surveys right away, walked in, said, hey, this is who I am, and they s took the surveys with no bias from what they were doing, uh, my intentions, etc. And I never asked for their names, which, of course, is very important. So there are six classes over the course of uh, every day they met with this teacher. We split them in half, so there were 12 teams. 
And so they went through the whole scientific process. The launch and chase is in blue because obviously the graduate students and the faculty here uh, took charge of that. Um, you can't have a bunch of eighth graders running around with helium tanks and et cetera. Uh, but they went through everything. Uh, usually two to three kids in their team were uh, in charge of each role. So there's a hypothesis team, design team, construct construction team, um, et cetera. So I got permission from the IRB board, which took months and months because not thinking, they are 13 years old. And so if you approach the IRB and say, I'm going to submit all these children to a survey and they're under 18, uh, it took a long, long time. But you have to get the consent form from the parents and then assent from the, the students. So I designed my surveys with a generally a Likert scale style, just strongly dis disagree, disagree, neutral, agree, and strongly agree. So then I took the average, of course, uh, fives. I weighted it so five would impact the, the statistics uh, more than number one. And then I used the student's t-test, specifically the Welch's student t-test, to see the differences between the two uh, population uh, groups. And that one specifically, uh, it lets you have two different, um, two groups that aren't equal. So just very broadly, uh, right off the bat, I set my the alpha to, in the t-test to 0 0.05. That gives you a 95% um, confidence that your project either, uh, that it didn't affect it, and 5% that, um, yeah, that it did. So I had uh, eight survey questions that I had for the bulk of my uh, research. And the only question that, was imp that changed was I think engineers work alone. Before the project, they, they did not think that engineers worked in groups. They thought everyone went on their own, did their work, came back, and you had to be really smart. So afterwards, uh, I'll show you the graph after, but uh, that was very encouraging. They learned the actual scientific process of learning, uh, working together, collaborating. And uh, I'll show you, uh, these are the other, ooh, sorry, one's deleted. Well, uh, they, they agree that astronomy is interesting. They were going through their astronomy unit uh, concurrently with my project. They do, they strongly agree that they do want to go to college. They're not sure, neutral, if they want to come here to UND. <laughs> I threw that in because they live here, so you either, you know, are deterred or you're, you want to go. So they don't really know if they want to join extracurricular activity, uh, and they don't know if they want to get a job, and they, they do have a specific career in mind. And sorry, I don't know why that seventh one is not there. Uh, so this is uh, their most anticipated classes in, uh, for males and females. Right off the bat, you see the females really like fine arts before and after. But my target subjects that I looked at were obviously math and science, the STEM subjects. And before and from before to after the balloon launch, uh, math and science both increased. Math was 57% increase, science was 63. Although you can't really say like, oh, you know, 57% is huge, but it's only seven kids to 11 kids. Um, they still remained with fine arts. Um, but it's quite different than the males. You can see it's more, uh, more uniform than the females. But science and math, science is the only one that really increased uh, with the males. But this is important to remember that science increased uh, in f favorability because if you look at the males' least anticipated classes, it also increased uh, math and science. And that you can deduce that either the ballooning experiment polarized them, whereas if you didn't like science or STEM before, you were more disinclined to pursue that in high school. But if you did like it before, uh, then it just, you just, uh, they didn't let, they didn't like it less, and then they, they, if they liked it, they liked it more. So then females, uh, the math, they clearly don't want to take high school math. Um, and then science is pretty even. Uh, these are the, uh, the graph on the bottom is the only question, the survey question that changed, had st uh, significant change. And it decreased by almost 24% that they now realize that engineers do have to uh, work in groups. And the top one is uh, that 
they have to work for NASA if they want to get in a STEM field. And they now uh, disagree that they can get involved in other ways, which is great because they're getting to high school. They could pursue a, a rocketry or high altitude ballooning uh, endeavor. So this open response question I gave them was really interesting because I didn't, I just gave them an open response. They put every single word here that's up on the board. My favorites are, it's only one or two people, but right at the top, waste of time, hectic, rushed. Some really enjoyed coming to class. They thought it was a once in a lifetime experience. Uh, but most, you know, it's just, a lot of them just thought it was fun, educational, and it was a great experience. Um, these questions I submitted to them just for uh, UND's purposes. This was our first time with this experiment uh, targeting an entire grade compared to the competition. So this is just for future recommendations for us, uh, such as they didn't like how cold it was. We launched at the end of November in North Dakota. <laughs> so uh, I agree with them. <laughs> uh, and then for the chase, we took a team leader for each group. So there's only 12 that went on the bus on the chase. And of course, everybody wants to go on the chase. So maybe we can re you know, look at that later. This project was for, uh, took place for over three weeks. I'll go into that later. But generally, they want a lot more time. Although for NSBC, that takes place for the entire academic year. So we have some considerations to look at for that. Uh, and a, a lot of kids realize that when you do work in groups, some people don't do their job as well as others. So that came up quite a bit. So on Halloween of 2013, I went in, gave the sent forms, pre the surveys, and then Mr. Newman, the teacher, he put everyone in their groups, and then the students assigned their own roles. And it was really interesting to see the dynamics of females versus males, who's speaking up, who wants to which roles. I assume, you know, construction, oh, that might be uh, favored by the males. And odd, oddly enough, it was mostly females. Um, and usually each team unconsciously elected a team leader who uh, just went around asking, like, what do you want to do? What do you want to do? So these are all the, the new log sensors that I gave them. They had a choice. They had to propose to Mr. Newman why they wanted to study which device. Uh, we had two accelerometers, UVB, humidity, two temperature sensors, carbon dioxide, oxygen, uh, magnetic field, and pressure. Now, the la uh, next section is space banana. The students had the option of coming up with the secondary payload, but they had to scientifically explain why they wanted to do it. One group wanted to just launch a chocolate bar for no reason. So obviously, they, they failed to get that. Um, but sp the space banana was a really big hit. Every single other uh, classroom that just walked by it, just it was instant attraction. And then we had three cameras on board as well. Now, new log sensors were brand new, and three out of the 10 really worked for us. And we've had multiple discussions on these are very finicky sensors. But when they work, they're really good. Uh, so the students did have fun. If, even if their sensor didn't work, everyone collaborated together and looked at it as a whole. So the design phase, uh, they were, it was the next day. They only had one day in class to do this. And this is a repeating problem where we had pretty much one to two days per uh, construct design or data analysis to go over that. But uh, they did prefer you know, if we had a little bit more time. The students had no uh, direction of you have to make, design your payload as a sphere or a pyramid or a, you know, a cube. We had some crosses and X shapes and some hybrids of squares on top of you know, pyramids on top of cubes. And uh, Mr. Newman actually emailed me one day and he said, guess what? I have two full teams here after school who just came voluntarily. And I didn't even ask them, you, know, you need to finish this now. So that was very inspiring. Construction was the second week. And this was memorable. Um, I gave 130 kids box cutters and <laughs> duct tape. Uh, but it was, it was fun. Um, they had one day in class to work on it, and then two days after or before school to finish it. And uh, my uh, education advisor, Dr. Engelson, came, and she was really impressed as well. Uh, so for the construction, they're, they're obviously in the pictures you see there's males and females. but 
she even, Dr. Ingelson actually told me, she's like, I didn't realize that the team leads would be the females. They took over. If the males were cutting the styrofoam, they actually cut squares right in the middle of a huge styrofoam board, not thinking that you can put it on the edge and save a lot more material. And then the girls would take over and, you know, try to amend the situation. But it's all, it was pretty fun and inspiring, so. Um, we had to buy a duplicate sec uh, tracking system, everything uh, double. So I put some arrows here. We had to get a lot, uh, two, another regulator for the hose and filling system. We got 10 new, new log sensors. Uh, we had to get double uh, another transceiver. We got a D710. We had to get another handheld receiver, another spot tracker. And um, yeah, I think that's everything that's double. And of course, more balloons. So we're going to use this in case we do any other uh, school-wide projects, but also now we have two for UND's ballooning program, which is great. So launch was Wednesday morning, November 13th. First time we ever did two launches, which was very exciting. Uh, the students had to stand out for 45 to 50 minutes just because uh, one of our hoses developed a leak and we were trying to fix it. We said, let's just go with one. We'll just fill up one balloon at a time. So that's where they got really cold, uh, 8 in the morning in North Dakota. Uh, so the 12 students came and so it was, ran very smoothly. We, uh, we found them right away. This is the, the flight trajectory that we took. The students, the 12 students were in the school bus with me and uh, they followed balloon number two, which was very convenient because they got back to school a little bit sooner than if they were to follow balloon one. Uh, they fell right in empty plot, uh, plots. And, no trees, nothing, no obstacles in our way. And so in the map, Fisher, the top left right to the west of Crookston, that's just 20 minutes away from Grand Forks. It got cut off on the map. Uh, one important thing that I didn't think of before our chase was 12 little kids every 10 minutes, so where's the bathroom? Where's the bathroom? And we're out, you know, you never know where you are sometimes. So that was a, a sticky note for us for next time. Uh, so the chase team, we had four of them. They rode in a school bus all together. When we found the payloads, they were able to inspect uh, the actual payload train. Uh, so you, um, you, you don't kill time uh, coming back. So we actually, the tracking system in our bus didn't work. It, it was working and then it short circuited depending on just how we had our system set up, which was a learning experience. And so we get getting phone calls from another tracking vehicle up ahead. So that was a, a little let down that they weren't able to interactively watch our uh, APRS software. Um, and then my last point here is that when we were out waiting for two of the grad students to go onto the land and retrieve the payloads, some young uh, male student came up to me saying, oh, I hear you studied astronomy. I'm really interested. Uh, can you tell me any of the prerequisite classes I should inquire about Ooh, in, um, in high school? I have no idea what I just did. Sorry. So in conclusion, I believe that three weeks is not enough time to work with over 120 students. Although when you compare it to NSBC, which is all year, uh, I think there's some compromise and some additions that you can make to make this much better. Um, they didn't, uh, all seven out of the eight of my survey questions didn't show any change. But overall, they really enjoyed and learned from this, and they learned that you know, you do have to work in a team if you're an engineer or anyone involved in STEM. They were just going over what a variable was, the controls, independent variables, all that, and they, they, impl they used that when they launched their banana. They had a control and they wanted to change certain variables about it, and Mr. Newman was very impressed. He was like, wow, you actually remembered my lesson last week. Uh, so when you have a real life, real world application, maybe they will tend to remember it a little bit longer, a bigger impact. So I also recommend that if you use this as a capstone project, because ballooning is such an interdisciplinary project that you can incorporate multiple teachers of the same grade to work together. Maybe you have a science, math, and even an art teacher. If you're trying to design you know, the payloads, maybe you can work that in somehow. Obviously, uh, we were in a bit of cold climate right then make this a little bit longer, and uh, 
when they were waiting around for 50 minutes, I wish we had something to do, either have them take some measurements, keep them inter occupied and entertained. There's so much that you can do with eighth graders, you know, such as like the ideal gas law and activities like that. So I don't, uh, what, how much more time? Are we out? Yeah, okay. Um, I have a video, but it's basically the pictures that we saw then. Um, if you wanna see it, we can, I have my laptop right there, we can go through it, it's five minutes. But. But obviously, I did not do this alone. All the grad students, Dr. Fevig, uh, my thesis committee, they let me graduate. Um, and uh, North Dakota Space Grant Consortium, of course, and um, everyone who helped IRB let me do this. So I thank you. Um, if there's any questions. Yes? Do you find it difficult to balance um teaching students versus their creativity on how much they can do? Not really, because when they were very creative and they wanted to give me examples of, hey, let's launch this in the payload, that in the payload, they were reminded that keep up this creativity, but you need to have a scientific reasoning and create this proposal of why you want to use you know, your example. Um, th when they come, when you look at their creativity with just construction, like the payload box, they were free to do whatever they wanted. Um, but we, ne we didn't restrict their creativity anyway. Does that answer your question? Yes, James. There are, rumor has it, downsides to launching in the spring, not least of which is that school ends and then you're done. You yes. can't do it. Um, and flooding and other things. Um, you really think this would be better in the spring? Yes and no. Um, NSBC always launches in the spring, and as you all know, this is our third scrub because of weather or other uh, implications. Um, I believe that either you, you start this and kind of put this in the beginning of the fall, maybe you could have something leading up um, in, in the actual curriculum, or earlier, uh, later in the spring. But it's, if you prepare, because we were standing out there for 45, 50 minutes in the cold, you, you can work around the weather because it, most importantly it's to keep it with the curriculum and line it up with their, their subject matter. But we've been going back and forth because we have NSBC and then we have this, which are different seasons. So. Yes? If you had an opportunity to add one or two additional questions to your, re, um, your IRB, what, what, what questions would those be and, and if you had an opportunity to do this again. Yes. Well, I know right now that when I well when I started it, I thought, oh, this is gonna influence their lives. They're gonna love STEM now. Just you know, do a 180 flip. But then I learned, you know, specifically they learned that, you know, you work the whole team work. The engineers don't work alone. They learned how to use the scientific method, which at in middle school that's when they're being introduced to it. So if I had to rework the actual survey questions, I think I would have targeted specifically of what they were learning in their lesson plan of, you know, the scientific method and collaboration. Whereas as I asked them as a whole, like, how do you like STEM and, you know, your, your path of, as a career where in eighth grade, you, odds are you, you're not even thinking about that. So essentially you gave them some sensors which did something very specific. So there was no creativity there, really. You gave them pressure sensor, they measure pressure with it. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us some of the things that they actually did come up with themselves that they flew? Like secondary payloads? Just well, however you call them. I mean, you talked about a banana. Was that yeah. a real banana? Well, we gave them the subject matter. We said, you can choose acceleration or you know, all the other sensors. Then we purchased the new logs because they wanted to study temperature or acceleration. Um, but the secondary payloads, only two teams proposed something. We accepted one. Um, I don't know if that's because of the time commitment. Maybe they could have come up with much more, many more secondary or third, you know, payloads. So what was that payload? The space banana. What, what's the space banana? That so, doesn't mean anything to me. Okay. They, they had two bananas, control banana on the ground, one in their payload. They launched it. They took quantitative evaluations of the, you know, the appearance, the, the taste of the banana. So after it came down, they all sampled the banana in little spoonfuls. And um, then they had to write their report on their primary and then the secondary payload. 
Did they do maybe to follow up with what James is saying? So with their primary payload, did they have to come up with specific experiments with using those sensors um, on their own? So you know, acceleration, did they have to come up with a specific uh, experiment using those? They use sensors the sensors for? just to the, the function of how the sensor works. But in their report and in their whole project, they had to do all the research about acceleration. They had to write why they wanted it, uh, <coughs> everything about acceleration, and then we just provided the new log sensor. So, um, yeah. Any other questions? We probably have time for another one. Yes. So how do you keep track of, you said the students, and as per IRB, you can't do this anyway, but. Um, you said they, you know, they didn't write their names down. Did they? What was the, your identifier so that yes. you could compare? Because you should compare, right? Mm -hmm. Student A to A. I, did they? Write yeah. So I had a beginning demographic section, which had their ethnicity, their uh, affinity to if they played with Lincoln Logs, Legos, Connects as children. I had uh, female, male, and then I had have you seen a balloon launch before? Have you seen a rocket launch before? And then I compared the just like ethnicity to females, and then just everything correlating to something else. But I didn't use a, you know, the alphabet system or, you know, your student A, your student B. Uh, there, I didn't, you know, there's 130 of them, and I thought that would be the best method. Last one here. Yes. You mentioned males and females. Mm -hmm. Were there other things that you watched? Minority students, for instance, or? Uh, I mean, had it been a college situation, you might have said, you know, non-traditional students or whatever. Yes. I was curious if there were other correlations that you were able to. That was my plan, but in Grand Forks here at Valley Middle, it was about 98% white students, and then there were barely any uh, other ethnicities. And then I did want to, just the things that I set out to compare came out with zero. Like, everybody played with a STEM learning toy when they were children, which I thought maybe this balloon experiment would influence the kids who never played with Legos, Lincoln Logs, or Connects. But everything just came back. Uh, everyone did this. Most of them were just white, uh, white students here in Grand Forks. So that was kind of a letdown, but it worked. <laughs>